Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And it's Jeremy from Tested. Welcome to Projections, our weekly show about virtual reality and augmented reality in early days of all this nascent technology. Mm -hmm. Early days still. Yeah, and one of the technologies that's definitely still in its early days, haptics. It's a broad idea. Right? I think haptics are super important. I mean, that's like the next frontier as far as I'm concerned, beyond the standard, you know, getting VR optics. Right, and any science fiction story about VR, mm -hmm. you know, Ready Player One, they have some type of full body haptic suit. And I think a lot of inventors and technologists are looking to those science fiction stories and mm -hmm. imagining how they can adapt those to the real world. So we've seen haptics gloves, things that make you feel your fingertips, all sorts of things. But a full body suit seems like it's got to be coming. It's right? the step beyond the controllers. Like we have haptics in the controllers and even that as Nintendo showed with the, you know, the old Nintendo 64, a little rumble goes a long way. So they're trying to expand that now throughout the body. And one of the companies making a haptic suit, at least for the top half of your body, is Hardlight VR. They launched a successful Kickstarter earlier this year, uh, and they've been making the rounds in a lot of VR conferences showing off their pre-production prototypes. Now, they stopped by our office to show off actual production units that we had never used before that they'll be shipping to their backers and to some businesses and consumers in the near future, and we chatted with their founder about haptics technology. So check that out. All right, Morgan, thanks so much for coming and giving us a demo of Hardlight VR. Uh, you guys work in haptics. How did this whole thing get started? So uh, we actually spun out of the University of Rochester's robotics lab. Uh, we started as a group of undergraduate researchers, and I watched my brother actually try to use a Kinect and fail miserably. Uh, I came back to the lab and said, hey, why don't we make a pair of gloves that's going to let you feel virtual objects? That was around the time the DK1 launched, and we tried an original like, DK1 with Kinect, and, uh, and haptic gloves, and it kind of spun out of control to where we are today. So where are you guys today? Because I see you guys did a Kickstarter, Jeremy in the back's wearing what I believe is one of your production prototypes. Uh, you guys have settled on a vest and arms. Yes, so uh, we are in the middle of production. Uh, the factory is in Shenzhen, and production is underway. Uh, the suits will be shipping uh, November 17th is our, our kind of finalized ship date. Uh, it was originally October, but uh, Chinese Golden Week and some custom stuff that we didn't anticipate got in the way. So we finalized our ship date, production's underway, and uh, yeah, we have a, a suit with 16 feedback zones, uh, uh, brain in the back, fully actuable between all the different points of strengths, intensities, effects, whatever you need to kind of vary create variables in the haptic experience. So the type of haptic, you guys are, the haptic experience you guys are designing, it's a vibration base, right? Can you walk me through the how you guys chose type of motors you're using um, and what type of sensations you can feel with 16 different of these uh, motors? Yeah, so this, is, this model is really the trial by fire. It was let's get it out, let's see if people really want haptics, and then let's see if they want it more or less complex. And the vote has been clearly more complex. The right. way we kind of got to where we are right now is we started with just a slew of motors. We went on basically Amazon and like some UK haptic stores and bought every kind of motor and every kind of actuator we could get our hands on and just began to experiment. What gave you the greatest breadth of experiences? What gave you the highest fidelity with certain kind of effects? Were they better on and off? Were they better with kind of the ramping effects? And which mm -hmm. ones played better into our plan of dev tools? Mm. And so we had an idea of what we wanted to see and what we wanted to offer. And then we searched and kind of worked for custom actuators that would facilitate that. Mm. Um, the motor we ended up going with were the ones that could do the light, warm sensations that were really important to us, but could also give you the kind of impacts that would kind of get people excited for the more the, the hardcore run and gun experiences. Mm -hmm. um, because haptics is a lot more than just getting shot. It's also the handshake, it's the haptic hug, it's you know a pat on the shoulder with your friend. It's also like the spidey sense, look out behind you alert. So all of these are so varied in what humans think they should be that it was important to us to find a motor that was important to do all of that. 
And so this motor is variable. I imagine, you know, at the strongest, it can feel like a strong vibration to give you a sensation of being shot, or, or it can be just a, a light buzz, right? Yeah. So uh, developer tool is something you mentioned. You, now that you have your motors locked down, what can the developers do with it? What type of patterns can they enable? What type of, you know, if you think about controllers, you know, even the Oculus controllers are pretty complex in terms of what they can deliver. Yeah, uh, so our, our our dev kit, our actual SDK, is locked down right now. It's only shared with our explicit partners, and if anyone's interested in getting their hands on it, they can just write to us. Uh, and we're happy to get it out there and start experimenting with it, or get them experimenting with it. Uh, the suit allows for in, uh, implementation in a number of different ways. You can do things like haptic animations, where like, mm -hmm. oh, I want to have this run across your body. You can draw on a person and save that. Right. Uh, you can also... Uh, create emanations, these kind of pre-programmed networking effects that will run from pad to pad, like a squirrel running across your body. Uh, and then you find you finally have like the pure programmatic, like, you know, impact, like physics-based uh, programmatic stuff you can do in the actual game engine. And it's all engine-based and it's all cross-compatible between different haptic products if you want it to be. Mm. Uh, that's one of the things we're really excited about. Uh, giving devs full control and full creative control over both... Uh, the intensity, where the effects are happening, and just kind of the speed uh, at which they take place. You know, if the developer is making a shooter, for example, they know when you're going to be holding a weapon, they know when you're going to get hit. But a lot of that also has to do with what the player is doing has to respond to the player movements, like if you're holding your hand up. Exactly. So how are you feeding back in the system what the player is doing? Is it just based on the controller? Is it just the IK based on the existing three-point controller system, or is there more data being fed back in the engines? So we actually do have uh, IMU uh, kind of gyroscopic tracking in the chest and arms. Mm. Uh, and so you have controllers and you have the head, and so you get full arm tracking. It, for a lot of the existing games that have I IK in them, it actually helps supplement those so you don't get the, the awkward elbow mm -hmm. flapping. And as a developer, uh, actually can tap yes, into that. exactly. Okay. We have dev tools accessible to, uh, we have dev tools accessible to developers allowing them to take advantage of that, use it however they want to. We're not gonna lock them down and saying, oh, here's our model, use it, because these people know their games better than we ever will. Um, so we want to just make their lives as easy as possible. For a lot of the arcades and a lot of the warehouse experiences that are making their own content, mm -hmm. we also offer that they can just basically mount their pieces on the, on the upper body so that it creates a much easier experience for players going into them and easier suit up, easier suit down, and so it's, it's really, really useful to just be able to provide tracking because, you know, I've done the demos myself where you see your arms and it's just a completely different experience. Sure. Yeah, and, and the best experience with Hardlight, obviously, is if the developer is going to be committed. You're working with how many developers now? Uh, we have 27 game studios mm -hmm. that are announced so far. Mm -hmm. uh, we have more that are on the way. A lot of them are literally just waiting on suits. Our biggest barrier to content at the moment has been the sheer number of suits we have available. Now, are you also thinking about ways that players and consumers who buy the suit can get benefits to it if a developer hasn't specifically coded the programming? Like, you know things like yeah. trigger, right? If you're playing, can, is there a mode you imagine where I tell the suit I'm playing a shooter, so if I press that trigger, give me a sensation of firing a gun? Now, uh, we haven't worked, we don't have a mode specifically like that, but we have an audio-based mode that'll uh -huh. take uh, kind of like a sub-pack or uh, some of the other um, audio-based haptic devices out there mm -hmm. that will run the suit based off a of band pass. You know, when the big explosion goes off, you'll feel it. Right, um, right. And those experiences are actually great. Uh, try listening to the Jaws theme in any scuba diving game, mm -hmm. and it's absolutely terrifying. It becomes a full-body experience. Exactly. And, but it's, uh, our focus was on the, uh, the actual integrated content. Right, so what's next? What's next for Hardlight? I mean, once you guys have shipped all of these, I know you guys have a, a wireless system you guys are planning on releasing, so you're not tethered to power or data, yes. but like, are you thinking about future motor systems and different types of haptics? Uh, yes, we are. We're trying not to put the cart before the horse. We're trying to you know, fulfill our promises before we get to you know, kind of up on our own Mount Olympus. Uh, and because we, we have made a promise to a lot of people that we're going to deliver them a product. And part of, you know, part of the reason we come out here is to say, show you, hey, look, it exists. Right. Uh, part of our campaign on our Kickstarter was don't take our word for it. Come see it. Come try it. Uh, but we do have plans. We've actually, uh, now that the kind of parts are away, everything's finalized, we've actually been, been able to start getting our, uh, our, our, our teeth back into the R&D 
uh, and we're looking at hot and cold, like kind of the, these uh, linear actuators, things that are actually going to throw a punch and it's actually going to move you backwards. We have a really, really talented R&D team, a really, really talented R uh, engineering team, and I'm super excited to just kind of let them off the leash again because uh, this, this came out of a student project uh, that spun out, and then you know, the engineering team was really gathered, and we produced this. And time out of, out of a university lab was so short to produce this that I'm super excited to what, see what we're going to get uh, for the next models. Awesome. And so are we. Thank you so much for coming and sharing with us this Thanks demo. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Nice awesome. Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure. All right, Jeremy. So uh, there, there, I think there are two things to talk about here. One, the, the base promise of this experience, and then the <laughs> software and the support, because everyone's got to have questions about okay. what can you do with it, right? So, right. you know, it's, it, it's a vest. Mm -hmm. I like the way they have their arm pieces, or um, they're attached to it. It's easy to put on. Mm -hmm. You're just zippering up a vest, tightening the side. Didn't feel too hot wearing it. They said that some of their customers want to know how to remove the arms, so they're mm -hmm. thinking about making the arms entirely modular. Absolutely. Yeah. And on that vest and on these sleeves uh, are 16 rumble motors. Yes, right. They're these big plastic plates, and inside of each of these plates is a single motor that's akin to like a gamepad rumble motor. Right. And so you know, Morgan talked about how they had tried and looked at different types of motors, and for you know this version, they chose something that was going to be cost effective. Mm -hmm. for their consumers because you know they're linear actuators they're rumble motors we kind of want the spectrum there's no one type of motor that's going to be the best for every type of experience right we want to mix and match and so you know he came from academic background he talked about doing the research um so it's it's not different motors on different parts of the body i think their their technology is one type of motor on 16 different parts of the body and in their implementation what, what we played this shooter um you know it was enjoyable. Mm -hmm. We played Sorrento, which you can download. It's you know it's freely available. But the Sorrento team is they they're most proud of of the implementation of these haptics. Um, and and I gotta say you do you do feel it, especially when you're firing the weapons. Um, the, and every weapon feels a little bit different. You're firing an Uzi, and it's this constant thing. And the more the the single shotguns are a little bit more of a you know single kick. Um, in general, I would say it's not enough of a sensation. To, to really make, to sell the effect to me. Um, in fact, when you're playing a more energetic game like Sorrento, where you're really involved in it, um, I feel like the action of the game almost takes more of my attention away from the haptics. The haptics are kind of like this underlying thing, the background. Right. It's just like, I, I, I actually want it to kind of fade away. I don't want the haptics to be distracting. I think immediately for, for the purposes of you know, a demo, like everyone wants to feel a punch hit them yeah. in the gut. Like that's not going to be enjoyable if you're playing, you know, super hot for for how many hours? I beg to differ. You want no, to feel the punch? No, I absolutely want oh, to feel the punch. Okay. I, I want to have that kick. And they they're, they talked a little bit about it in your interview a little bit the future of haptics. Maybe they will amp that up mm -hmm. with kickers, big solenoids. Yeah. Um, no, but I want that. Um, okay. Maybe not in the multiplayer scenario. Right. You know, right. they made a really interesting point when we were chatting with them about how some of their some of their backers said. How can I disable the haptics in yep. the game? Because yep. potentially it is a disadvantage. Yeah, because absolutely. when you're getting recoil from a gun, you actually are at a disadvantage because it's going to be moving your arm, which your opponent may not have that. Right, right. It's the same as someone playing a 2D game and turning down their graphics to get better frame rate. Yeah. Fewer distractions, blocky shapes. But I absolutely agree. But in single player, I want to be more immersed. And mm -hmm. I think we don't have enough experience with haptics to know how much of real world haptics. Is it relative? Rumble? Does it need to just make the game more immersive. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, at least initially, low-level rumble, even at, if it's part of, at a place in your body that you don't expect it, um, is going to incre increase the level of immersion. See, I, that's, that's where I, I think I might differ with you again, is, is that I, whereas I felt it in my arms, I was so excited by the game. And it's fast-paced. I'm jumping around. Mm -hmm. I'm firing in the air. Yeah. I'm running towards, and I have these bad guys in my face. Yeah. So much of that is already viscerally going on that right. the rumbles I was feeling in my chest you didn't need it. was almost background noise. Huh. And it didn't, it didn't affect the immersion much more than I was already getting from the VR experience to begin with. Got it. And you couldn't use it as a cue, a game cue. Exactly. Example, so like. that's where I think maybe with a different game, maybe more of a puzzle game, or even like if we take, for example, Echo Arena. Yeah. There's a thing in Echo Arena where, somebody, where you can grab your opponent's quietly come up from behind ninja, grab their, their right, back and right, right. fling yourself off them. Well, if I could get a better sense that they just grabbed me, 
Yeah. That might be very helpful, and that's a very calm, quiet game. So maybe that would lend itself more to a haptic experience. And speaking of like the actual placement of these motors, like the game, the the, the vest looks very tactical, right? Mm. There are these plates, lots of plates and plates in the abs. You know, there are plates in the pecs and then plates in the back. And so I asked them why, you know, how do they achieve this? design is it for the aesthetics so it looks like some type of tactical vest yeah or just because it has that military look or is there some anatomical like design to this and they said that in their research coming from the academic background your muscles on your abs are the ones that have the most sensitivity you oh. know, like the most they, they correlated how many muscles like the muscles to the motors right mm -hmm. you have more muscles in your abs so they put more motors there but in practice having six motors there and having two motors there probably isn't give you that much more benefit. Right, I, yeah, I would, I would think that the, a stronger motor, right. fewer stronger motors might be interesting. And I, maybe more distribution, put more hmm. in areas that you normally don't expect to have hmm. to have sensation, right. so when there is sensation, you notice it more, right? It, it's know? also tricky to get those motors as close to your body as possible. I mean, I really want, I strapped that thing on pretty tight. There were still loose areas. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's gonna be something that is, like just the fabric that haptics makers use yeah. is going to have to um, involve some ingenuity. Maybe something really stretchy that really grips you, like a workout suit or something like that. Now we also mentioned that the, they're working with developers, right? So we're gonna talk about like 26 or 28 developers mm -hmm. and they currently have signed up in some that unannounced, but that is the chicken and egg problem. You know, when you're making a third party accessory and you're trying to get people on board and there is no like open standard for haptics, what are develop, you know, if you buy this, if you're gonna invest over $500 on this vest, I don't necessarily want that, just the audio subwoofer rumble on this. I want catered experiences. Yeah. And I, I don't see a ton of developers jumping on this, at least in, in the scale. Yeah, you're talking about it from a development standpoint. Like, yeah. how do you get people to develop for maybe a single SDK that is right. Rumble? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And, and I wonder if we'll even see that until the main headset manufacturers implement some sort of haptic you know, development standard themselves. But it makes a total lot of sense for location-based VR. Right? If you set up an arcade, whether in the States or mm -hmm. overseas, and you're making your custom experiences, and you're using Rips or Vives, you can program something and give those people paying however much for the, for the arcade time right. a better experience by getting, and those people will, will benefit from it's that. It's true, and then you're talking about giving people an experience that they can't get at home, not, exactly. just, not just from the, the actual software itself, but most people aren't going to have haptic suits and they're gonna be curious about that. And, and maybe they'll be more receptive to those sensations and you can be more dramatic about those things because they'll want, they're only gonna play it for you know, 15, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, right. they're gonna want as much, as a much immersion, as much sensation overload mm -hmm. from this experience they're paying for. Uh, another benefit of this suit that is, isn't related to haptics is the, uh, the tracking that you get built in. Oh, right, they hadn't unlocked that yet, but yeah. they said in this first version, there are IMUs in mm -hmm. the arms. That is interesting because that will allow you to do much better arm tracking, know where your elbows are in particular. Yes. And so this is something that definitely is it's a, it's a benefit we didn't even think about going forward. Anyone mm -hmm. making a haptic suit or things you're gonna wear on, why not put trackers on there? And right now it's IMU, so you get an improved you know, IK, right. but there are opportunities to put, you know, mount in steam pucks or other systems to get you better tracking and give developers not only a chance to give you haptic feedback, but take data from your body and they can be, uh, it can be another controller essentially. So right. like if I have that <laughs> feedback, you know, if, if there's a solenoid in my arm mm -hmm. and I'm playing, you know, the example they said was like a boxing game, you know, I'm not pressing a controller, I'm using my hands. And so maybe I'm still holding the controller and I'm holding my hand up, I want the game to know that I've held my hand up and then feel a punch right here that would be on, on my arm. Interesting to see a game developed for this suit, you know, ground up where, where yeah. maybe you are deflecting things and you run out of shields and each rumble is a shield yeah. and you have to get just that in the right spot. That would yeah. be fascinating. Totally. I, I think this is an, a curious first implementation of yes. haptic suits. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, it's going to be from what they've told us, the, the location base, the B2B potential of this is high. I don't think it's necessarily something that you and I are going to necessarily want to invest no, in, but I, mean, I do want some more time with it. The Kickstarter was successful, $150,000, yeah. but only 350 or so backers. I think yeah. that sounds like a B2B kind of, kind of yeah. product. Um, 
for per personally, as a consumer, I want haptics. I just want more. I want more kick. I want you to hurt me. We want Gen 2. So good luck to Heartlight VR. I wish them the best because they clearly have a lot of thoughts about how to move this product line forward. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to see what they come up with next. So earlier this year at GDC, we played a new game that came out since then called Killing Floor Incursion. Zombie game, you're running around in catacombs and you're fighting off zombies with a friend. And you should play it with a friend because it's a lot less scary that way. Um, well, since then, uh, at OC4, they've been developing this new horde mode. And we got a chance to play that. Yeah. Um, awesome. It's, it's a free expansion for Killing Floor if you already own it. It's going to show up in your account. And it's basically a... You know, your standard horde mode, where you're in one environment and you just fight all, wave after wave of increasingly difficult zombies and, and baddies that come after you. And anyone who's a fan of the original Killing Floor on your desktop PC yeah. know that the developers have paid a lot of attention to the gun mechanics and also the dismemberment model. These are creatures that you can shoot their heads off, shoot their limbs off, grab their arms and beat them with them. You could use a, a melee weapon to cut off their bodies. It's pretty gruesome. I know you're going to want to watch some footage. So we actually chatted to the developers about this new mode and we'll show you what we played. Hey, I just had a chance to play Killing Floor Incursion here. It's the new update called Holdout. I'm talking with John Gibson. Hi, John. How are you doing? I'm doing great. So tell me about Holdout. This is a free update for Killing Floor Incursion owners. Is that right? That's right. So we launched Killing Floor Incursion in August with a, a full story-based single-player campaign. But a lot of the feedback that we got from the players is we want something with high action, high replayability. So we listened to what they said, and we created Holdout. Mm -hmm. So Holdout is a horde mode. Yes. Uh, you can play with one to two people. Is yes. that, and uh, tell me about it. Is it uh, it's, you're basically in one environment, and then what happens? So you're fighting in an environment, and it starts out fairly easy, mm -hmm. and you've got some basic weapons, and then it just ramps up more, more difficult enemies, more difficult weapons. But one of the cool things that we added for Holdout that's not in the regular campaign is these power-ups. So the power-ups give you that short power fantasy. Like you saw, you picked up the berserk power-up. You could just run around and just punch people and they would fly off into the sky. Or the vampire power-up, you could steal their life. So even though it's, it's getting very, very difficult, you've got the power-ups to sort of, to even the odds. And as far as the enemies go, are they the same enemies from Incursion or have you, are you introducing anything new? The enemies are the same, but we're using them in different ways. For example, some of the big guys that you were fighting as, as you got to the more difficult levels, those are the bosses in Incursion. So in, in most cases, you're only fighting, well, in Incursion, in every case, you're only fighting one of them at a time. In, in Holdout, you, you could be fighting four of those boss characters at one time. So it gets really, really intense. If I choose not to pick up the, the power-up, if I choose to wait and use it you know, deliberately, maybe when a boss shows up, uh, will mo more spawn, or is picking that up sort of setting that cooldown timer for the next one to, to pop up? Uh, right, there's no cooldown timer, but saving them for the big guys is a really great tactic. You know, it, on the surface, it's, it's a very quick game type to get into, but if you really want to last a really long time and get the high score, uh, you start using tactics, like you saw the nuke power-up, which you grab it and it kills everything on the screen. That's a really great one to save until you get four of those bosses just in your face trying to chew you up, grab that power-up, they're all dead. Um, and you can have three of those power-ups in the world at, at one time, so you can stack them. You can just wait, and then when it gets really, really heavy, grab all three of them. Okay, and you mentioned lasting a really long time. Norman and I lasted about 10 minutes. Yes. I'm pretty proud of that. What, is a, what is a really long time? I mean, 10 minutes is doing really well. Um, in co-op, I think the longest I've seen somebody last is 15 minutes. Um, in solo, I've seen somebody last 20 minutes. But I'm sure that when we release this, we're going to get some, some amazing players that are going to last 30 minutes. But, but there will be a global leaderboard, so we'll get to see who's the best in the world. How do you keep that difficulty ramping up constantly? You said that the levels could potentially go on forever. Right. So we, re we really don't do anything uh, cheap like adding more adding more health to the monsters or anything like that, but we have uh, AI capabilities that ramp up. So when the, when the monsters first come out, they're moving kind of slow, they're doing some, some kind of mild attacks. As it ramps up, they will, they will be sprinting at you, they'll be jumping in the air, flying towards you. Um, more and more of the bigger, more powerful monsters will attack, uh, the, boss, the guys that are bosses in the normal mode, and they'll start doing even more dramatic and powerful attacks. Cool. And this seems like it definitely favors teamwork. You have to work together, um, not just for reviving, but for maybe working back to back. Uh, what strategies have you guys found already work pretty well in the game just internally? So stay close to each other. 
um, you, the tendency is when the horde shows up is is to run away. And there'll all be one guy run away. You know, I'm scared. They run away. But but back to back, you know, fields of fire, um, and don't grab the power up as soon as it appears. Um, you know, share share ammo and health. Uh, some of the tendency is, you know, players they're playing on my health's down 10%. They'll grab the ammo or the health pickup. Meanwhile, their buddy's at 5% health. So communicate, talk to each other. Do you need this ammo? Do you need this health? Um, communicate on how are you going to use the power ups? You know, hey, there's a big guy. Let's wait. Or the big guy's about to kill me. Please grab the power up. Uh, throwing each other weapons. And that's that's one of the great things that you can't really do in a non VR game. You know, I mean, you can drop a gun on the ground, but in VR, you can just th literally, your buddy needs help. Throw him an AK, throw him a shotgun. That's super cool. It's a great update, and we look forward to playing it some more. All right, thank you. And we're really excited. This is a free update that, that everyone that already has the game is going to get. So, very excited. Cool. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you. All right, so I got to tell you, I do like the power ups that they've yeah. added to this. Um, it, it's fun because that's what really sets us apart. Um, from the game. I think there's also one additional weapon, mm. um, but the, the power-ups are where it's at. It, you, they basically spawn randomly throughout the world. Um, so you're fighting off these waves with your buddy, and then you might see a power-up appear, and one of you goes to get it, and you both receive that power-up. Yep, yep. Um, which is a way they can you know, slow down time, for example. Right. Uh, I love that co-op aspect where you know, we were playing on a rooftop, and it wasn't back to back necessarily because I think that wasn't the best way. It was basically I was watching you from across the rooftop, <laughs> shooting people as they were coming, yeah, uh, and then grabbing power ups. You were splitting up mostly, but it was chaotic and it was it was intense. I don't know. I, I prefer the back to back. I'm a little like, scared yeah. in those situations. <laughs> I want I want somebody to have my back because it's whatever's going on behind revive me. Revive me, that's revive the me. Scariest part. I did need a few more revives than Norm did. Um, but the, the power-ups are, are definitely fun. The, the interesting part is, I feel like we were so new to this game uh, that there were clear ways we could have played it better. Uh, one is by preserving those power-ups. So like, <laughs> yes. you just don't grab them right away. Because yeah. you can get, I think, up to three spawns mm. in the world, and then you choose when to use them. Particularly the nuke one, yeah. which uh, you know wipes out everything in the world. You want to wait for those serious baddies to show up before you use those. And I really love the the progression of weapons that spawn mm. throughout as you play. I, was, I love the two-handed weapons. This is one of those games like if you play, you know, a vibe game like Onward, um, and you built a PVC mount for with the stock for your controllers. I want to play Killing Floor Incursion with some type of gun mount because I was mm. holding those touch controllers up like this and I wanted to have a gun stock because you're looking down the sights. It felt it felt good. It felt satisfying. I, yeah, I totally agree. The, the problem is all the weapons look and feel a little bit different. So yes. like, do you grab your different stocks for the one that you need or do you right. just make one that's kind of I, I like my favorite gun. I like the carbine because you yeah, also yeah. have melee models that. So if I'm holding mm -hmm. you know, my two controllers and I run out of ammo, I actually can knock them with the with the stock. And yeah. If I, if I have something there, then it feels like I, uh -huh. I'm actually doing it. That'd be fun to build. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's things on Thingiverse to 3D print to augment it. Totally. There, there to are. Put that together. There are absolutely. Um, I I don't like the melee weapons so much personally in games like that because the uh, I feel like it, back to haptics. I don't feel like the it's the right feedback. Like as soon uh. as I grab a sword and it's it, it's weightless. I, I'm lost, the immersion is lost. Right. Then when I hit somebody and there's no feedback, but the guns, I've, I've come to you know, appreciate just a little bit of rumble is all I need to make right. me feel like I'm actually firing. Well, it's, it's why you know, on, on the Vive, the Vive 1s, even though they're a little bigger, yeah. maybe a little heavier, I, it feels like you're holding you know, a lightsaber handle. It does have the, the right? better grip for that. Exactly. Uh, but that's Killing Floor Incursion's holdout mode, and so it'll be out uh, in early November. Uh, both for the Oculus platform and for the Vive platform. We talk a lot about games that haven't come out yet, previews for games on our show, but there are also a lot of games that are already out yep. that we've been playing. And we want to take the time to recommend two of them that, Jeremy, you and I have been playing uh, independently. So uh, what have you been playing recently? Well, there was a game that a lot of us backed on Kickstarter back when VR was brand new, and that, that's uh, The Gallery. Yes. Right, so that came out, the part one came out, I don't even know, maybe last year, I yeah, suppose? Yeah, it came out on the Vive platform. One of the first games that had, that introduced the teleportation mechanic for room scale. Isn't that you, amazing? When you teleport, it wasn't, the whole rectangle, your whole play space mm -hmm. would be mapped out to where you wanted to move it. That's so right. Sense like, oh, okay. That fire pit over there, yeah. that's my room scale. Right. That's interesting, because uh, Valve kind of adopted that for their lab. Yeah. Um, so th anyway, the, the sequel to that has just come out, um, whereas the first one was more of an adventure game. Uh, the second one is definitely more of like a puzzle room, like an escape room. Oh. Um, and it's not just one room, it's like several spaces. But 
I almost like we got to play this back at GDC. And I took the headset off, and the first thing I said to the guys was, did you guys get a lot more money? Because, <laughs> because like, they really figured out graphics yeah. and, and VR interface. I, I think that this is a good example of a slower paced game with a lot of really interesting applications for VR interfaces. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're, you're basically in this sci-fi fantasy world. And spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> and all of the all of the, the the environments and the puzzles they involve using VR in interesting ways. It's, and there's also this telekinesis you know element to it where you're moving objects. It's dexterity. A lot of it's like yeah. it's not just your brain, but like how finely can you move the the, the key to fit in the hole it or has the, the that, ring around yeah. you know the wire. It's like those thing. carnival games where you have to avoid touching the, yeah. the metal to the right. other side. Right. There's a lot of things like that, and uh, the the. The presence is strong. Uh, the environments are well, you know, well drawn, and it's, it's it's pretty solid. Personally, I actually got stuck. So it is a game where you know you're not going to run through it. Uh, there, there's an element of like you patience required, which maybe isn't my strong suit. I actually I went to a YouTube video to say like, what do I do next? <laughs> Turned out like you have to do things in a certain order. So it has that old school adventure game. You can go places and not be able to proceed until you mm -hmm. go back and get the object that you need. Um, what so, I like yeah. about some of those puzzles, uh, the design, is that when you compare it to a game like you No, know, I, uh, I Expect You to Die, you know, or, or games that are big buttons, like puzzle room type right. games, like interactions for some of those games are because of your big buttons, big levers. Right. Here it's very fine control, mm -hmm. very near field, get up and around a puzzle, look around it, and, and, and make your precise movements, take advantage of stereoscopic 3D right. and also sub-millimeter precision tracking and make that part of the challenge. So mm -hmm. it's both the mental, figure out what goes where, but also the dexterity requirement. Right, and, and putting you in an environment where things feel real, like everything feels technologically possible mm. in VR. It's just interesting. It's, it's, they, did a, they did a really nice job. Very cool. What about you, you don't have to play oh. the first one to, to play this one? Oh no, I don't think you really do. I mean, it's because you might have a better context for what's going on, but there's, no, it's a puzzle room. If, if you enjoy solving puzzles, and especially like VR intricate like puzzles that require your body to move, um, yeah, absolutely, yeah, pick it up. It's on, I think it's on both platforms. I think it's in Oculus Home as well as Steam. Is yes. it in Steam? Yeah. 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 Uh, what I've been playing is a game that we also got a preview for earlier this year called The Invisible Hours. Now, if you remember from one of our early episodes of Projections, I was super excited about this game because mm -hmm. it was an exercise in immersive theater storytelling, a narrative-based game where the interaction is very, very minimal. You're basically playing as a ghost watching this 45-minute long story unfold. Now, you're, like, you ask yourself, well, you're paying $40 or $30 for a 40-minute experience, but that's not it. You could, you're, the idea is that you watch seven characters solve a murder mystery. It's like almost like the movie Clue, but every perspective is different. I think production-wise, I'm really intrigued by this title. I haven't spent any time with it since our first demo at Silicon Valley VR, I yes. think we saw it there. Um, but I'm super intrigued by the production of this because I think it's unlike anything else that we've seen. They, they took real actors yep. and they recorded them, um, you know, basically performance capture. performance capture in spaces that resembled what was being, sh you know, rendered in VR. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. So the environment is a mansion on an island. So it's not that massive, right? It's like this really detailed two-story mansion that belongs to Nikola Tesla, and what and, and there are rooms and scenes and and, and people are acting out this this narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you watch some of the YouTube videos, like the actor who plays Thomas Edison in here, like they are actually hiding behind boxes, looking around corners, <laughs> putting their hands on walls yeah. as they're wearing these tracking suits to get the full performance. And then all of that is then, of course, facially animated and f animated for the characters. Mm -hmm. And the question I think you had when we saw the preview was, does this game need to be in VR? Like, couldn't you play this? On a flat screen, mm -hmm. and and with as, as a passive camera, use WASD and a mouse. And technically, yes. Okay. But I think VR brings a lot to it. I mean, I think it's a, it's the same as asking whether you could play a game top down or first person on a two D flat screen, right? You could play it RTS style, or you could play it in the first person. Uh -huh. Playing the first person gives you a little more immersion. Well, playing in VR gives you the extra level of immersion. There are scenes I really don't want to spoil the story, but if you're in a room with a character and you're following them. They don't notice you because you're a ghost. Of course. But they're being honest and they're, the, the acting is incredible and there are some shocking twists and turns. I feel tension 
being in that room with them as they're going through this monologue or as they're going through this breakdown or well, something. It's interesting. This is a new form of theater. I mean, yeah. we, I only first heard of immersion theater from you last year or earlier this year. Yeah. Um, and, and we've seen a performance here in San Francisco called The Speakeasy, uh, the Speakeasy which is very similar where you go into a performance and there's three mm -hmm. different rooms and yep. you can follow this story wherever you want. And there's no way to follow the entire performance. With they, one playthrough. One, with one you know, playthrough, viewing. viewing, because you, by necessity, have to leave the room and miss something. Yeah. Um, so that, that goes, that's the same for this. I wonder, yeah. does your appreciation for this game, is it augmented because you've seen th this in live action? I would think that's actually, uh, that would make me more critical of hmm. this game, because the real world immersive theater experience is, is far superior because it's many more actors than just the seven. Right. There are some technological limitations. Uh, and the game does give you some tricks. Like, like I don't, again, don't want to spoil the story, but mechanically, you have the ability to pause time. Mm -hmm. You can jump and teleport between characters. You can you know, rewind time, fast forward time. Can and you it, fast forward having never watched it, or do you have to watch it in real time once? You don't have to watch it in real time once. Okay. You can fast forward. And I think a lot of people are playing this. It's on PSVR. It's on on uh, HTC Vive and Oculus, but a lot of people are jumping between the characters as you go through the chapters. Like, I'm not gonna start chapter two until I've played everyone's, seen everyone's perspective for chapter one. My recommendation is the first time you play it, stick with one character or play it without freezing time, without using your god powers, without going back to right. the menu and seeing what, what everyone's seen. Get the honest one character experience or explore naturally and feel like Embrace missing out on the story. <laughs> That's hard, isn't it? It is because you, you feel feel FOMO. I'm literally sitting in a room yeah. watching two characters have this intense argument, and the audio is so good that yeah. I can hear down the hall some something happening, interesting happening. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, do I check that out or do I stay here? Well, the game lets you pause time and lets you rewind time. Don't do that. Choose an option. Choose your right. adventure. Choose the story, and it's okay that you're not going to see everything because when you do go back and when you review it. And it's about maybe four hours that it takes to go through everything. There are so many nice twists and turns that you're gonna feel very satisfied when you get the full story. So that's more satisfying if you don't watch, you choose every adventure as you're reading the yes. book. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's, it's interesting because we used to read these books when I was a kid, the Choose Your Own Adventure yes. books. And it, you do, if you find a bad ending, you do want to rewind time. Yeah. Go back, yeah. choose the other way. There's no bad ending. There's only what your first experience was versus your full understanding or better understanding yeah. of the full story. And then credit to the writers, credit to the, the performance actors, and credit to the sound design. I think they did a really like, really mm -hmm. cool thing here with designing a space and making use of positional audio. This was a Spanish team? Yes, is that right? yes, yeah. Tequila Works. And they did a, I guess they did a, a PC game that was another similar time loop style game where they had to rewatch, rewatch a, a story. But so they, they're really interested in this type of uh, story narrative experience where you have to rewatch the pick out and get the full full breadth of it. I think there's an interesting experience to be had here socially. I mean, it's not a multiplayer experience. Like that yeah. would be interesting. I wish that you could have multiple people in this game as ghosts. Maybe yeah. like you could see them go into different rooms and maybe you could talk to each other. Um, but you could still approximate that experience if you just sync up and play That's together right. at the same time. That's so you, what I would recommend. You phone, maybe you're on Skype, you call up your friend, you hit play at the same time, and you both experience that story together, and then maybe you go to, and take diverging paths and compare notes. Yes, and I would say, uh, because it is a four chapters game, and there's loading between the chapters, just make sure you sync up beforehand and, oh, yeah. and make a commitment not to pause and not to, <laughs> right. not to rewind to make sure it's all sync. So it's called The Invincible Hours. It's out now on all the major VR platforms. Um, but those are our two recommendations for this week. We'll be back next week with more demos, uh, more game reviews, and more interviews. Um, until then, we'll see you next time.